for the invitation, guys. I really wanted to be there. Unfortunately, family restrictions, but uh, uh, didn't allow me to come. But uh, Gregor will be there in a couple of weeks, I think, and he'll be uh, happy to continue discussions and, and hopefully now also during the discussion sessions we can uh, go over this a little more. So the idea of my talk is to give you a status report on the effective and fair approach to both the post-Newtonian and post-Minkowskian expansion and the connections between the two which are allowing us to, what I wrote in the title, bootstrap the relativistic two body problem through Feynman interest, which is what we do in the effective theory approach, using post-Newtonian boundary conditions to resum all the velocity expansion. This is working in collaboration with a bunch of awesome postdocs uh, that I hope are in the Zoom land right now, Christoph Dapla, uh, uh, Lapa, uh, Gregor Kalin, Samuel Liu, he, you, uh, Cho, Cho, and C, uh, G, uh, Jan, and they will be very happy to answer questions if summarize uh, during the talk. So this doesn't move. Okay, good. So uh, here is the outline of my talk. Of course, the reason we are here is because we want precise theoretical predictions for uh, uh, gravitational waves emitted by binary systems. I have split the, my talk in two parts. I know this is very ambitious. I always run out of time. So hopefully I, I give you some feeling of where we are right now in the effective theory for bound and, I, and unbound states, the post-Newtonian and post-Minkowskian expansion that you already heard a few talks already in the first part. And the second part, I will try to answer some of the questions that are also, I mean, the talks are often late, so I, I watch them later. Some of the questions that people ask, so how can we use all this scattering data to learn about bound states? And this is what we like to call this boundary to bound correspondence that allow us to extract gauge invariance observables for scattering and transform those directly to gauge invariant observables for bound orbits, perhaps uh, in the future, bypassing entirely the need to compute like gauge dependent quantities such as uh, the Hamilton. So I don't know if I'm gonna uh, uh, do justice to all of this, but hopefully we'll initiate some uh, discussion. So briefly, uh, before I discuss some results, let me just put everybody on the same page. Let me uh, briefly introduce this effective filter approach that was put forward uh, by Walter Goldberger and Ira Rostin that goes by the name of NRGR, people complain sometimes because it's non-relativistic general relativity, but the main idea was to use effective theories that are uh, common, uh, commonly used in QCD, like non-relativistic heavy quark effective theory or non-relativistic QCD, because we can use this very powerful method of regions to compute in our formalism the effective action. This effective action, or sometimes also called in the post-Newtonian regime, the so-called Fokker action, he knows about the binding energy of the system and also knows about the decay width that give us the immediate power that is what we observe in gravitational wave uh, radiation. Now, how do we compute this uh, effective action? So we do it with the so-called method of regions. So first we do everything in the classical regime. So we do it in the standard point approximations. We never see loops of the gravitational field, although you should be able to include those. They are relatively straightforward. Uh, to include loop, loop effects of the gravitational fields, but we will always compute the, the classical solution. That, that means those are three level Feynman diagrams of the gravitational field. And the regions that we have, in principle, we have compact objects that could be neutron stars, black hole, or anything out there that we haven't yet found through any other type of observations. So there are some structures, some inner structure of these bodies, what we call finite size effects. So that's the first case we have to deal with. We don't know what the full action is. There could be some internal degrees of freedom. So we integrate out those finite size effects and we match into a point particle theory where all the degrees of freedoms about like the mass, the spin, and the so-called love numbers, et cetera, are all dressing up this wall line classical source that is treated as an external uh, source into the path integral, which defines here the classical action. Then comes the interest over the gravitational field. And here there are two relevant modes that there is the, the, what we call the potential modes that is causing the binding of the system that gives you the binding energy, which is one of the important ingredients that we need to compute the waveform. And we're gonna concentrate mostly in the spiral re regime here and to match later with numerical GR and quasi-normal modes and so on. So we here have a clear separations in principle in the different regions of integration. We have the binding energy and they have the much longer radiation modes that are the, the ones that travel to infinity that we observe. We integrate out those radiation modes and we compute the fluxes. 
As we will see, those radiation modes also produce radiation reaction forces. And this is part of this uh, discussion that we'll be having in post Newtonian and post Minkowskian uh, uh, computation, which is how to treat these radiation reaction effects, because they contribute both to the dissipative and the conservative dynamics. And this is something that is now, when we want to go to very high level of precision, something that we need to take uh, into account. One of the good things about doing this split into regions into potential and radiation modes is that the very complicated green functions that we also saw, for example, in self force computations and so on, can be split such that we can expand in the very different regions of integration. So with potential modes, we treat them as quasi-instantaneous interactions and therefore we span in the retardation and that makes the integrals extremely easy, much easier than the full relativistic integrals that we'll discuss in a minute. In the radiation region, we do a multiple expansion, and that also makes our integrals much, much easier. However, we had to pay a price, and we spoil the infrared behavior in the potential region, and then we spoil the UV behavior in the radiation regions. And for a while, this created a, an issue because you run into ultraviolet divergence, infrared divergence. However, if you are consistent, if you regularize these divergence, for example, using dimensional regularization consistently across both regions, then there is a cancellation of these spurious infrared and UV poles, and you get an ambiguous result. And I mentioned all this because for a while, there was an obstacle in the traditional approaches because of all these divergences and the, the introduction of ambiguity parameters and so on, that effectively the theory approach naturally uh, resolved. So very good. Uh, so now you can cut the machine, you compute your binding energy, you compute your fluxes, and then you compute your waveforms. And then you might ask, well, at what order do you want to get? How high in this post-Newtonian expansion do you want to get? Well, first of all, we're going to get at least to the level of precision at which we can distinguish between the, the different uh, uh, nature of the compact objects. For example, do you have a neutron star or do you have a black hole? As is well known in the post-Newtonian literature, there is an effacement of the internal structure and therefore the tidal effects Let's ignore spin for a second. The tidal effect, the tidal deformability parameters, also known as love number, they start at five post Newtonian order. And therefore, we need to at least get to that order of precision to be able to tell a neutron star from a black hole apart if we are not looking at counterparts. And then the future of gravitational wave astronomy, the Einstein telescope, LISA, cosmic explorer, are going to increase in sensitivity. We're going to have longer waveforms with higher signal to noise ratios. We might be able to see. Uh, up to even higher post-Newtonian order. We might be sensitive in the phase evolution to even six post-Newtonian order. So right now, as I will describe, we are in four post-Newtonian order, so we still have a way to go to reach the level of precision, sorry, that will be needed by future detectors and even to also do a lot of interesting physics. It was discussed earlier, I think it was Will Ift, um, about the emission of gravitational uh, atoms of ultralight particles condensated around uh, black holes. And this is the direct emission from the cloud that forms, for example, a stochastic background. You can also see it directly. However, this is very weak. There is a signal that is also produced by a binary. And this signal is much stronger. You can even see farther away. And the effects of the clouds could leave an imprint to tidal effects in the waveform that can teach us about new degrees of freedom, the spin of these particles, the masses, and so on. But to be able to probe these ultralight bosons through binary black hole observations, we need to get to high level of precision. Very good. So that's motivation why we keep doing this. Now, most of my talk is going to concentrate on the conservative part for non-spinning objects. And the reason that I do that is because that's where we have reached a very high level of accuracy and also where new results have been coming out recently. But I don't want to give the wrong impression that that's the only thing we do. In fact, we, we got to the end. We compute the fluxes, not only the binding energies, but also fluxes and phase evolution. I want to show, for example, this result here which is the phase evolution due to spin effects to four post-Newtonian order with linear and quadratic spin effects, which is the very state of the art of the post-Newtonian theory, including all the spin information and also finer size effects due to a spin that is what will be used to produce a more accurate uh, waveform. So we do follow this through until we get to the phase evolution. However, the, the conservative part is conceptually very interesting. It's actually the hardest part. The radiation is the easy part. The conservative part is actually the hardest to calculate. And this is where we've been getting a lot of insight from different methods, from the post-Newtonian and post-Minkowskian expansion, as I will uh, describe. But I don't want to give the wrong impression, because some people sometimes say, oh, but you guys have been computing potentials. 
What about the dissipation? What about the fluxes? Well, we also compute those. Uh, very good. So where, where, are we right now? where are we right now with the post-Newtonian expansion? I think this was mentioned in some of the uh, talks before. We have reached the next to next to next to next to leading order beyond the Newtonian interaction. Uh, there's a long history here. I don't have time to, to describe. So, I mean, this is going on uh, for a while. The four post-Newtonian order has been reached by three different methods, di different uh, approaches. So we are very confident that the solution is correct. However, this was obtained not without some hiccups because even though we are in the conservative sector, we have not turned off radiation. In fact, radiation reaction produces a very important correction to the binding energy through the so-called tail effect that people have already mentioned uh, in, in this conference and also during the program. There's a scattering of the radiation off of the background of the binary that comes back and renormalizes the binding energy of the system. This produces a logarithmic correction to the binding energy. This is not a typical UV logarithm, it's an infrared logarithm. So you have to be very careful about how do you treat this logarithm correction to the binding energy. It's an effect which resembles something that we have seen in, in, uh, in electrodynamics. In fact, it's very similar to what we observed that was computed in the lamp shift. In this case, this uh, uh, tail effect, this tail logarithm is the equivalent, it's a classical version of the lamp shift correction to the binding energy of the hydrogen atom. It's the same, it's an infrared logarithm that dresses or renormalizes the binding energy. However, it produces these divergences that I mentioned at the beginning. And the traditional approach, these infrared divergences, the way it was regularized, introduced these ambiguity parameters that were fixed in some cases, for example, in the computation by Damour, uh, Schaefer, and Jaranowski to self-force calculations, which is also what we just heard, uh, one way to compute the solution at some order in the mass ratio. However, in the effective field theory approach, we understand what we're doing. In fact, I wrote a paper about how you do this precisely uh, with the lamp shift, for example, in non-relativistic QED, and then you have infrared divergences, you have UV divergences, they cancel each other out. You have to be careful not to have skin dependence if you have different regulators, and that was the problem with the ambiguities. But if you do this correctly, then you get what you get, you have no freedom, the divergence cancel out, you end up with a number that corrects not only the universal logarithm, but the celebrated factor of five over six that we get in the lamp shift. We get a different number here, but it's basically the same, uh, the same idea. And I think also Stefano mentioned that they have computed all these numbers, all this, the equivalent of this five over six, but all the, the higher order multiple corrections um, to the tail that come with this logarithm. So the logarithm is very universal. In fact, it was known by Thibault and Luc uh, Blanchet since a long time, but this five over six was the whole point because if you don't do this correctly, you get it wrong. And in fact, Feynman himself got it wrong. And I've mentioned this many times. He had a, a problem with the regulator when he computed the lamp shift. And in fact, he apologized to French and Weisskopf to de de delay their, the, their paper for a while because he actually was getting the wrong answer. So you have to be very careful how you compute the contribution from the Baustein and the ultra soft contribution from the logarithm to get all these correct numbers. But we understand this now very well. And the calculation of 4 p.m. now is well solid uh, established that we understand what the tail contributions are. And for sure also all these potential contributions were also known and people computed in different ways. As, as I was saying, for example, these integrals are four loop integrals that can be computed. These are three dimensional. Uh, Intel that can be computed with many methods from collider fixes that we, we have learned uh, um, throughout the years. Um, very good. So as we keep going, if we're gonna go to the fifth post-Newtonian order, now is when the trouble starts. And, and uh, I, I was listening to Stefano, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, um, answer some of the questions when people started asking, well, what happens with this uh, tail and memories? So what is happening here? So what happens here is that we go to the next order and then we have all these tail effects. You're scattering up the geometry, but the geometry now is sourced not only by the mass, not only by the energy, but also by the angular momentum. And in fact, it's also sourced by the whole series of multiples. And when you have this interaction with the background, then you start picking up higher orders, both in the PN expansion and also in the mass ratio. So in the new, in the, in the expansion in the symmetric mass ratio, no. So we have tails at order nu, at order nu square, nu cube, and so on. But we might also have uh, we may also have nonlinear memory effects. What are those? Well, you could scatter off the background, but you could scatter off the radiation. 
this system is emitting radiation. The radiation was emitted earlier. The waves go off and they find this radiation that was emitted earlier, trapped in the, in the geometry, and they scatter and then go off. And this effect could also, in principle, produce a change in the binding energy. Now, I don't have time because I only have half an hour to go into these details. I'm sure people are going to ask about them. But I want to emphasize that both the tails and the memories, they both enter with this structure of three quadrupole moments in the effective theory, and they enter both at four post-Minkowskian and five post-Minkowskian order, at g to the four and g to the five. And in fact, they are very important that these terms from tails are also here. And I, I'll get back to that. But what I want to emphasize here is that we are entering a level of precision in which these details of our understanding, the conservative contribution, a higher order than self force, these are new, well, I, the extra new is just because you're counting the M in the energy, a new square or new cube, depending on how you look at, all these effects start to matter. And we have to get them right if we want to understand how the phase evolution uh, works. Uh, very good. And one way in which we can understand this, by the way, is also through this post minkowskian expansion, because one thing, one thing that you might notice immediately when you look at this is that I'm saying, ah, I'm scattering off the geometry. What does that mean? Well, the whole geometry is producing, for example, the Schwarzschild solution. And that is a scattering off of a mode, which is just like a static mode, which is this potential mode. If I'm gonna tell you now that I'm gonna go into the post minkowskian expansion in which I don't want to expand this potential modes, I wanna keep the potential and radiation mode as, as one single region, which is often called the classical sub-region. So maybe we can start understanding that the tail and the memory are just two manifestations of the same thing. And in fact, you already see this in the calculation of the leading tail, because you could have done the calculation with the full memory associated with the mass, but what happens is that conserve current. So you never get a dot of M. And therefore the answer will be equivalent to say, ah, oh, you just scattered off the geometry. But that calculation in principle encompasses everything at the same time. So this is a very natural way to understand all these tails, memories, and set, et cetera, in the post minkowskian expansion. And it's also a motivation for us to go in that direction. And this is what I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do next. So in the post-Newtonian expansion, we have reached the four post-Newtonian order. We are understanding the spin effects in the phase evolution. There's an computa ongoing computation to get the fluxes also at 4 p.m. So we have complete waveforms at 4 p.m. orders with all spin effects. And we understand a little bit of the conservative sector of 5 p.m. with the potential contributions, which by the way, I think Stefan also mentioned, if you know the interest at 4 p.m. because of factorization, you get the interest at, 4, at 5 p.m. Uh, automatically. And that's what the, the group of Johanne Blumland and collaborators use to compute the 5 p.m. potential contribution. And that, now we're starting to discuss about what happens with all this hereditary effects, all these radiation reaction effects. And this also <clears throat> takes me naturally to these other developments that have happened in the recent years, which is we understood how to do this post newtonian expansion for a while. We have these effective filtering methods, but recently we have also learned to do these integrals in the fully relativistic regime. And then you might ask, well, can I just resum all these velocity corrections? It, it's true that if I truncate my, my propagators, my green functions, and I expand them, the integrals are much easier, and we can do up to five loops. But right now, we have a lot of tools, collider tools that also Julio mentioned in his talk, that are allowing us to actually get these integrals and resum all these velocity corrections. So it's a natural question to ask, well, can we start putting this and pushing this also into the post minkowskian regime? And there's another thing which is very nice about doing post minkowskian um, uh, theory, which is we can compute a gauge invariant object. We can compute, say, the scattering angle or the impulse, the change in the total uh, momentum. And then we don't have to worry about gauge dependent quantities, which coordinates you're using. The scattering angle is a beautiful, very simple observable that we can get. And then maybe we can resum all the velocity corrections. In the second part of my talk, if I have time, I'll tell you how to use that information from the scattering angle to the bound state. And therefore, we find a completely new way to solve the two-body problem. We go to the scattering angle, we go to a gauge invariant quantity, we resum all the velocity corrections, and then we use that information for the bound state. And that hopefully, and that have been analyzed by different groups, can give us even more accurate uh, waveform models, and hopefully also teach us how to understand these hereditary effects uh, better. So here, the history is a little different than in the post-Newtonian expansion that goes back 
to, um, well, people say Einstein and Hoffman, but actually there was this guy, Dorste, earlier, and Lawrence, and I'm sure there is a Dorste for this Westphal guy, but we haven't found it yet, but we think that in 85 was the first time that the first post-Minkowskian calculation of the impulse and the scattering angle was done. The 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. calculation was done by this guy, uh, Westphal. That was much, much later, I think, it, it was posted in 2018 and published in 2019, this very nice paper by Cliff Chong, Michael Solong, and Ira Rostin, in which they rewrite this calculation using these methods of the scattering amplitudes that uh, Julio uh, mentioned. So all this was happening. We are developing this effective theory of post-Newtonian, and they start looking at this calculation and thinking, well, we could also readapt this effective theory approach to the post-Minkowskian expansion. And this is something that we started doing together with uh, Carol Cullin around uh, a year and a half, uh, two years ago. And we started rederiving these results. In particular, we rederived the 2 p.m. calculation. And it's actually quite simple because these are just two Feynman diagrams. In fact, uh, one of the nice things about doing the post minkowskian expansion is you can use the wall line theory with the proper time. We can use this so-called Polyakov action. So there's only a linear coupling on the wall line and that simplifies your life uh, tremendously. And this was relatively straightforward. Uh, we computed the second post minkowskian order. In the meantime, there was, this, there was this breakthrough by the group of Spivern and collaborators that derived the uh, third post-Minkowskian order. And this it started showing that this wasn't as simple as one might think, that this was this simple functions of the relative velocity of this boost factor that gave us the, the resum corrections in the scattering angle. They started fi finding these interesting functions, this space of functions that resum all the relativistic uh, corrections. And this was for us a benchmark. So how can we reproduce this using the effective field theory approach? And actually it turned out to be relatively straightforward once we realized that there was a very powerful method that we can use to bootstrap the answer to all orders and velocity using these methods of differential equations that is known uh, since, a, since a long time and actually uh, people started developing new tools to solve these this, uh, this, uh, differential equations, which means you, you have a, a, an integrand for the scattering angle, you reduce it into master integrals, and then you find when you take derivatives with respect to the uh, uh, kinematical variables, that the integrals obey some differential equations. And in fact, this is very nice for our case, and this was also pointed out by Julio, um, Michael Ruff, and, and Mao Sen, uh, there's the single scale integrals. And, it, and it, through a change of variables or to this variable x, in fact, you can find that at least to 3 p.m., which is what we found, that the solution to this differential equation is extremely simple. You can transform this differential equation into what is called canonical form. And this canonical form can be solved in terms of what are called polylogarithms, like logarithms, dilogarithms, and so on. And for this particular 3 p.m. result, only the logarithm appears. So this funny sinh function is nothing but a log of this function, uh, sorry, x. <clears throat> so then we're in business because we start seeing that the only thing that we had to compute once we solved this differential equation was the boundary condition. So this was like an RG type flow, which told us, you give me the post-Newtonian data, which is in the limit of velocity goes to zero, or this gamma goes to one, you have to do some calculation here. But we have done a lot of integrals in the post-Newtonian approximation. We know what the solution is. In fact, this 3 p.m. boiled down to a lot of these bubble integrals that we have done since a long time. And then this RG flow, this differential equation, resums all the velocity correction for us. And in fact, it was literally like an RG flow because we got a logarithm out of it. So this is a very na natural way to solve this, this uh, uh, master integrals that give us this uh, bootstrapping of the two-body problem because all we need to do is solve a differential equation, solve this RG flow, and get the post-Newtonian data as boundary condition. And it, and it turns out that um, in terms of setting up the uh, computing the integral, at, at first you might say, oh, but there are the Feynman diagrams, the Feynman rules, and so on. And it's true, this could eventually become a problem. But at 3 p.m. at least, there were just a few. There wasn't that many. In fact, these two don't even contribute. So it was, and this, this are actually set by the one-point function. So we could even use the Schwarzschild solution to compute them. So there was only one set of, of, of integrals, so to speak, that we really needed uh, to compute. So this really okay, gave us five a, minutes. Oh, okay. Oh, shit. Um, that we could go to uh, um, uh, higher orders. And then we started going into four post-Minkowskian orders. 
And here it gets very interesting. It gets very interesting because the, this is the order at which radiation reaction effects start to matter. This is where this tail effect that I mentioned earlier start to matter. So when we compute the boundary conditions for these differential equations, we not only get contributions from the uh, uh, potential region that goes into the conservative sector, we also get conservative contribution from radiation reaction effect. And this was very interesting because it added to the uh, solution more, more, uh, uh, more regions for the computation, but it was also interesting because at four post Minkowski order, the solution to the differential equation started to introduce new space of function. And some of those functions were these elliptic integrals. So we started getting elliptic integrals out of the solution of the differential equations. And then all we had to do was compute these boundary conditions, which again, they were reduced to the same post-Newtonian calculations that we had done before. And then we recover here the tail effects that agrees or is consistent at least to the first cell force approximation with everything that had been done before. We also got some contribution uh, from potential and, 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 and the non-logarithmic part of the tail. And we got a combined uh, scattering angle of four post Minkowski in order that you also heard from the talk of Julio uh, earlier that um, it has been shown to do much better than the third post Minkowski order in comparison with a numerical GR in the calculation of the uh, scattering amplitude. I don't know if you can see the answer here, but it has logarithms, dilogarithms, elliptics, uh, uh, and so on. So now the question comes, and this was part of the uh, discussion also earlier, this includes the tail, this includes this logarithm of V, which is in this variables is right as log of one minus X. But what about these other corrections that are five PN, but G to the four could also uh, contribute here. And I don't have much time for that. So I'm, I'm gonna skip it and people are gonna ask me and I'm gonna come back to it. Um, I just wanna give you the, the uh, take home message here of these calculations are what we mean by bootstrapping the two body problem. It looks like we have a po very powerful tool here to solve the relativistic integration problem, which is the true bottleneck of this post minkowski expansion through this method of differential equations using the PN, all the experience that we have from post-Newtonian calculations to get the boundary conditions of this differential equation. Now we have contributions from potentials and radiation modes, but we understand how to do this through the method of regions and we are progressing towards higher orders. So far, it's not the Feynman diagrams that give us problem. It's not the Feynman rules because there's a lot of redundancy that you can play with. It's not the real bottleneck. The real bottleneck is the integration, but we are learning a lot from collider physics on how to do this integral. And we are now progressing towards the next order, the five post minkowski order, and we are somewhere halfway there, hopefully maybe next year, uh, uh, this year, or maybe next year we have uh, this result. So I'm gonna skip over tells and memory. Um, because I don't have time. So very briefly in the next few minutes, I'm gonna tell you about how we're gonna use this information, this angle, this post minkowski angle to learn about bound states. So we have all these beautiful results that uh, 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 2 p.m., et cetera. And you might ask me, how are we gonna use this to learn about bound states? You really heard, uh, I, uh, I don't remember who said it first in the, in, in the conference that there is a way to match into a Hamiltonian. So you can get a Hamiltonian that reproduces this scattering angle, and then you can use it for any bound state, any state that you want, it's universal. And of course you can do that and there is nothing wrong, but it's case dependent, it's, it's very cumbersome because it's a function of momentum, then you have to invert momentum and energy and so on. You might ask in the very much unshared spirit of working with gauge invariant quantities, do we really need this Hamiltonian? And in fact, you don't. You can go straight from the uh, scattering angle to observables via analytic continuation. I don't have time to talk much about it. Let me just give you the flavor of how this works. We found in, in, in uh, our first paper together with Gregor that there is an analytic continuation between the, the point of closest approach in a scattering process and the endpoints of motion in a liquid like uh, uh, motion that is described here. And once you realize that you, if you compute an observable like the scattering angle, which is the derivative of the radial action, which is computed as the integral of the radial momentum, and then you compute the periastrum mass, you advance and you realize it is the exact same function, one for positive energy, the other one for negative energy, one for unbound, the other one for bound, but it's the exact same function. Uh, there is a caveat here that I'll get to in a second. And therefore you realize that if these points are connected, then I can go from the angle to the periastrum advance just looping around infinity. And lo and behold, this is one of the most beautiful formulas I've ever seen. 
the scattering angle and the periastral advance, they are basically the same thing. You give me the scattering angle, I give you the periastral advance. And this now means that we're in business because from the scattering angle and the periastral advance, we can reconstruct the entire radial action. And if we can reconstruct the entire radial action of the bound and unbound problem, the entire radial action of the bound problem gives me all the conservative observables to differentiation. So I take a derivative with respect to J, I get the periastrum, but I get a derivative with respect to E, and I get the radial period. I even get the redshift function, and we check this with Gregor, and it matches beautifully all the post-Newtonian data. We can do it for spin effects. Align spin effects scattering also has the exact same relation between scattering angle and periastrum advance. And this is a beautiful formula that tells you what their bound radial action is to second post Gaussian order with all spin effects up to, lin up to linear and quadratic in the spin, up to just a, a few functions of this boost factor or this uh, relative velocity expansion. And from here, you can get all the observables. Let me show you just one very quickly without spin to make it easier. This is a 2 p.m. Just tell you what I show you without spin. And then from here, which just descends directly from the scattering angle, I can predict all to all p.n. orders, the one over j squared correction to the periastrum advance. And we did this before even 5 p.m. was known, and this is right on the money. We use, for example, the 3 p.m. data to reproduce the 2 p.m. result, and this goes on and on. And now comes a hard part. I'm probably running out of time. So I can also go back into the discussion, which is what about radial Just a little, just a little. I have time? Okay, good, good. You got so two minutes. Effects. Two minutes, okay, good. So what about radiative effects? Well, if you've been listening, you realize that all you needed to prove this was this relation between the, um, the endpoints. And if you compute in that total radiated energy, say in a hyperbolic motion, what are you doing? You're integrating the flux between minus and plus infinity. You're doing elliptics, you integrate the flux in a closed orbit. But this is the same as going between R minus to infinity twice and between R plus and R minus twice. If this flux is even as it is because J to minus J is actually even the flux invariant, then you do the same looping that I told you earlier, except that you pick up a minus sign. So the total radiated flux in hyperbolic and elliptic are related by just a flipping sign in the analytic continuation. The angular momentum, same story. However, this one is odd. So now you get a plus. And now comes, uh, let me just give an example, which is actually very pretty. Take the 1 p.m. result. This is the leading order, the quadrupole, and then the 1 p.m. correction for hyperbolic, and then the analytic continuation I wrote in terms of the eccentricity because this function is often written in terms of, sorry, the eccentricity but it's the same thing because the eccentricity is just this function. You do the analytic continuation, this guy becomes pi, and you reproduce exactly the elliptic case. I will check this to all the PN orders that are known, third post Newtonian order. It works for spin, align spin as well. So now comes the hardest. 30 point. seconds. 30 seconds, good. I haven't told you anything yet about the tail effect being having local and non-local in time contributions. The tail effect, unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends how you look at, introduces non-local in time effects. What does that mean? That means if I truncate some post Newtonian order, and I write an effectively local expansion of my Hamiltonian or the momentum or the radial action that reproduces that non-local dynamics. And then I compute with that uh, Hamiltonian. If I do an hyperbolic Seconds. or an elliptic calculation, I get different answers. And therefore, only in the large J limit, this, this works. And since uh, 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 I'm gonna get uh, um, uh, 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 no call. <laughs> We're just gonna say, morning is a good, a good point. Raphael, can you just go to your conclusion? Yes, you, I go to my conclusion. Go to so. so conclusions, there is a lot of development now in the effective theory approach. We have reached state of the art in post-Newtonian, post minkowskian post spin effects, radiation effects, fluxes. So we are learning a lot from our collider friends on how to do a lot of these interlocks. And this is the beginning of what I think will be progressing in understanding high precision gravitational wave models that will be key for the future of the Einstein telescope, Cosmic Explorer, LISA, et cetera. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We still have some time for questions. <laughs> Did I really run out of everything? Hi. Thank you for the talk, uh, Sebastian Bernuzzi. Um, just a clarification. Did I get right that you have the full waveform at 4 p.m.? The spin effects. Because the okay. fluxes at 4 p.m. without spin are, are uh, undergoing. I mean, we don't have the 4 p.m. spin less flux yet. But all the spin effects to 4 p.m. 
we have now included uh, with uh, uh, this recent paper that I, that I mentioned, which is not included in LIGO. Actually, somebody correct me, but I think LIGO doesn't need LIGO, Virgo, correct. They don't even include 3 p.m. spin spin effects. Maybe now they do, but so this did, is the 4 p.m. Did you compute also uh, re, re, uh, the residual amplitude? So did you factorize the result? What, what do you mean the residual amplitude? We compute the phase evolution due to spin effects, including everything, tails, radiation, fluxes, everything. I'm not sure what you mean by the residual amplitude. We have the, the fluxes and the binding energies that allow us to compute the, the integral that, the, that uh, it was shown in the previous talk of the, of the omega dt. That's what we, we did. Okay, and the results are published and available. Yeah, 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 it was a few months ago that we finished this calculation. Okay, thanks. Let me go to the online question, Gabriel. Uh, hi, Rafael. Hi, Gabriel. Uh, nice talk. Um, I wonder why you didn't have any odd powers of V in your 3 p.m. scattering angle? In my 3 p.m.? Ah, because I'm conservative. Angle. I'm conservative. So that's not the physical scattering angle. It is the one that allows me to compute uh, the binding energy. It's the one that through this dictionary that I told you, yeah. uh, for example, here, I can get the periastron advanced conservative yeah, and binding energy and so on. But if you do the full relativistic calculation, you get that too. Yes, if you do the full, yes, but this is the shortcut to this piece, which is the one that is relevant to compute like the phase evolution. We get binding energies, we get fluxes, and that we put into the phase evolution. Of course, it's also useful. That. You Sorry? should have said that. Okay, okay. okay. I, I, I thought I said conservative everywhere, but okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, okay. It's not the physical scattering. Well, no, no, no. I, I have to say this is, the, okay, it's not the physical scattering because it's not inclusive, but includes all the information that we care for the bound state. If you're going to compute a binding energy, which is what we need, to compute the phase evolution that I showed you earlier for a spin, for example. This is the guy that you want. This is the observable that you want. So it's easier to compute the full guy, and it gives you half of the work that you need to do the phase evolution. You mean there is no radiation reaction on of the trajectory? Is. Of course there is, of course, but you treat that independently. Oh. You compute it here, for oh, example. Let me, let me show you uh, where I have it. Uh, I don't know why you like to separate the two. Oh, we, this is this is how these calculations are often done in the elevatic approximation. You say, I solve the binding energy, I compute a flux, and then I say the phase evolution, the change in orbital frequency in time, is computed in this approximation in which I take the binding energy, I take the derivative respect to the frequency of that conservative uh, uh, object, and then the omega dot I compute with the flux. And then I compute waveforms in this adiabatic expansion this way. And I can go as high as I want. Okay, but I thought you said that yeah. the binding I energy is Gabriele. I think and, uh, I I shut up. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, Gabriele. I think we're gonna. We thank you. Let me go to a question in the room. Hi, Rafael Stefano. Hi, Stefano. I know you're desperate to talk about the memory of IPN, so this is your chance. Uh, about sorry again about the memory. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Let Let me just do a few things about, say a few things about the memory. Uh, uh, I don't remember, what, let me go to PM first. Uh, where is PM memory? So here. So here, there is this calculation by Bloomland et al. Unfortunately, I don't think they did this correctly, like uh, separate the dissipative and conservative piece of the memory. I believe if I understood you, Stefano, correctly, uh, that you computed the in, in and you try to also separate the conservative and dissipative. My problem here, is that when I try to do that with Johannes Resolve, I don't get the same flux that people have in the literature. So unfortunately, it looks like this calculation is not reproducing the flux that you would expect for the memory. But from what I understand, apparently we don't have the same multiples. So what you guys, what Stefano, what you're comparing with this Lux Resolve, we should not be comparing with, because that includes radiation reaction square and maybe even different multiples. So we have to be careful. So we have right now, I have to be honest, not a clear understanding what is the conservative part of the memory yet. However, what it does look to be the case is that these operators in the wall line, they must be there, both for the tail and probably also for the memory. Now it's not clear yet what the contribution from the memory is, but for sure they have to be there for the tail. 
How do we know that? We know that because if we go to the PM calculation that we computed, and we want to match this PM calculation into the wall line theory, your operators that you have in the wall line theory, these guys are essential. Without these guys, I don't match my result at higher orders in nu. And here, there is something with the mass scaling, which is uh, uh, very important, which is that in the way we're doing this calculation, as you, do, as you know, Stefano, we're using a trick. The trick is that we know that the conservative part of the, of the uh, tail uh, calculation can be captured by Feynman in-out uh, boundary conditions. So the result that we obtain is obtained using the Feynman boundary conditions because we know it picks up the tail. How do we know that that's correct? Well, we also know because of the mass scaling. We also know when you look at the tail contribution to the angle, there is no way to get something that is not new. All the higher order effects, the new squares, new cube, et cetera, they all come from these functions, which by the way, is something that Gregor and I found and he was generalized, um, that tell you all these new square, new cube, et cetera, are uniquely set by the leading order tail. However, to match this in the EFT, the new square, there is a new square for sure in the tail. It has to come from these operators. The QQE is not enough. The QQL is not enough. So we know for a fact that those guys must be there. It does not just couple to a concert correct. It couples to a concert menu. That's correct. But it couples to EL and the QIJ. The real question is like, what happens with this guy? Is there here also for the Q coupling a potential anti radiation region? And this is very subtle because naively, through this mass scaling that I just described, there is no way to get a memory contribution unless it's uniquely determined by the tail, like this, this couplings. However, notice that our calculation, Stefano, is in the center of mass. And the center of mass brings this funny one over M's. And remember that we also have the X double dots. So we have to be very careful about the center of mass. And I'm not gonna say more about this. And Sam is gonna talk about this as well. There is something very funny going on with these effects. Uh, but recapping, we only were able to get the tail part, the tail or the new, new square, new two, all these guys are there. However, whether there is a, for sure at 5 p.m. this memory is gonna show up. Whether there is a memory at 4 p.m., I should shut up and say, I don't know. I'm not sure it's zero. That's all I'm saying, okay? Okay, we've got another question in the room. Yeah, can you go to the slide where you have the uh, consistent in quotation marks, uh, Rafael? Ah, yes, because, because uh, so why did I put quotation marks? quotation marks here mean? Do they negate the consistent or do they some sort of- No, no, it's because the result that we get, which is, uh, is uh, um, the same result that is also obtained through scattering amplitudes with this uh, principal value, the principal value on Feynman are basically the same here. Yeah? is not consistent with the new square corrections of bloom line at all. So I say consistent because I think that bloom line at all did not correctly separate the tail from the memory, did not even correctly get the conservative part, I think. And therefore, at least to first order in the cell force, if you look at this part of the, of the, of the tail, all these pieces are exactly the same to any PN order that you want. The pieces here that come from the higher orders in new that you get from this mass scaling, they don't get the same. So I say consistent because the new square corrections, we have to continue seeing what's going on. And, and what about uh, Stefano and what about Vini et al? Well, Vini et al have the, the uh, second cell force calculation that, in, no, it's not, sorry, second cell force, it's this mass scaling. So in a sense, we are consistent with them. The two different prescription and these are right on top of each other. That is completely consistent, however, it's not obvious to me that that's everything there is. That's something that we need to yet uh, understand. So maybe I should say Bini at all, it should, it's fully consistent, you're right. Now, uh, what Stefano recently showed is that they sort of agree with Bloomland. They also have a memory. If you include that in the angle, you get a different new square. So I guess Stefano will tell me that it's also inconsistent with this result at higher orders in new. So we need to still sort this out to see what is going on with the PM calculation versus this PM uh, result. What is clear though is that we are- Rafael, I'm with... gonna go, I think you addressed the question. So let me move to one more last question and then we'll go into coffee break. Okay, hi Rafael, this is Julio. And thanks oh. for a nice talk. Very quick, yes or no question. 
Do you now agree that there's no new squared, there's no two SFPs in the conservative scattering angle at 4 p.m., yes or no? Do I agree that the scattering angle that we are computing here includes everything in the conservative sector? Yes. Yeah, you know, I, I am inclined to think that the, if you compute this in the initial center of mass, which is the one that we are calculating, and we try to get this memory piece into the calculation, of a, of, a, of a conservative calculation in that frame, I now tend to believe that I agree with you, that there is no way, because we are now doing the fully lean, there seems to be no way to get this guy in there. However, you have to be very careful with radiation reaction effects. So I think there is a caveat here of how we compare with the radiation reaction effects that you have in the center of mass, especially when you go to the bound case. So I, I tend to agree with you now, that yes, in the scattering angle, it looks like there is no way to get this piece in there, but there is something funny going on when we try to match to the EFT, and, and, and we can discuss that later. Okay, thanks. Okay, very good. Uh, let's thank uh, Raphael again.